so my name is Shuli Goodman. I'm the executive director of LF Energy, and I'm really thrilled to have you all be here. Uh, this is our first uh, LF Energy mini summit. So we have a really busy morning. Um, I actually am here in uh, on the west coast of Cal uh, in California. Um, so I am on Wednesday at 5.48. Um, but for you all, it's a morning and we have a really busy morning. And first I'm going to take some time and set some context for the day. And then we'll have Dr. Catano from Sony Computer Science Laboratories. Following that, we'll have five pre-recorded videos uh, two from the Netherlands, uh, two from France, and one from the United States. Since you heard from me earlier today, I'm not going to talk about too much about the imperative about why we must decarbonize, because I'm going to actually assume that you understand that uh, climate change is real and that it is the greatest challenge that faces humanity. What I want to talk about is the path forward. I want to make sure that each of you understands that in the next 10 years, the choices you make professionally and personally are going to have a really big impact in, in either being part of the solution or part of the problem. So my goal is to enable you to become leaders in developing the strategies, the products and the services that will enable the planet to decarbonize our economies. So, for me, this chart says everything. Since the 1850s, first of all, it's a composite of data that comes from our world in data. And um, since the 1850s, at the advent of fossil fuel and the internal combustion engine, the growth of fossil fuel use has driven GDP while at the same time producing an invisible pollution, CO2 emissions which are the source of climate change. In the last five extinctions on earth, every single one was caused by too much carbon. So we actually understand what happens to the planet when there's too much carbon in the atmosphere. This, however, is the first time that it's been caused by humans and by human productivity. So what you see here is that our wealth has been driven by fossil fuel and However, we have reached a path where the externality is actually now causing a kind of collapse. So, you know, the number is 75% is, it's a little fungible, um, meaning that sometimes it is 65%, sometimes people say 75%, but it, really what it's saying is that if we remove the carbon, the fossil fuel from our power, our energy, our electricity, our transportation, our vehicles, our cars, our buses, our trains, our boats, our planes, um, that we can provide 75% of the reduction in CO2 emissions that we need in order to stay below one and a half degrees. I think that you saw in my presentation where I was showing about the fires that have surrounded me um, for the last three months. and. You know, what I say to that is, is this is what one degree looks like. I really don't want to find out what two degrees look like. So these are our marching orders. And this is why this conversation with you is one of the most important conversations on the planet. And I really mean that because I really want you to understand how you can do your part to transform the world and leave it a better place. So our friends in Denmark are probably quite a bit farther ahead um, than most other places on the planet in terms of decarbonization. They estimate that 50% of the effort of the energy transition is digital. That's a really um, large number. And, um, but you know, when I think about what's happened in telecommunications, you know, when you have telecommunications transitioning to 75% for virtual, um, it kind of makes sense that we are being able to build software defined infrastructure and we're being able to use software to network electrons. We can't actually physically network an electron, but we can network the metadata about an electron 
to orchestrate energy. So based on what we've learned at the Linux Foundation, that means actually that 80% of that code will be open source if we kind of go with that 80-20 rule. So based on that, for utilities, I think it means that we have to learn how to move at the speed of technology. And part of the value of open source really is avoiding vendor lock-in, being able to accelerate uh, innovation um, and be able to use a leveraged development model. For vendors and OEMs, it means building the future with your customers. And that's a very powerful thing. I've talked to enough of the OEMs, vendors and suppliers to know that for the most part, um, they actually don't know what's gonna happen three years out from now. They don't really know how the grid is gonna be transformed, particularly as automotives, uh, as vehicles actually really begin moving towards electricity and we have to begin orchestrating that. For consumer electronics, appliance and device manufacturers, you know, those of you who make HVACs and heat pumps and uh, all kinds of things, whether they're washing machines or uh, water heaters. Um, what it really means is that we have to ensure interoperability and the scaling of new products and services because this is how we are going to be able to orchestrate demand flexibility. And for transportation, we wanna be able to ensure that the vehicles that you are going to be building are grid enabled and able to provide both a value in terms of a resource and also a load to the grid. So this is what LF Energy is. This is what we are going to do together is we are going to build uh, the reference architectures, frameworks and a supporting ecosystem of complementary projects. How we conceive of this is that LF Energy, the ecosystem itself is one of the ground zeros for building the energy systems of future. And so towards that, I really invite you to come and join us. And, you know, isolation, going it alone, really are no longer viable. And the despair of making those choices and going and you know, in, in that kind of go it alone sort of way is really not possible. These are our members um, and uh, we have had uh, quite a lot of growth in our members in just even the last couple of weeks. And these are our projects. And I'd like to say that we've got another three that are coming in by the end of the month. One of the things that I wanted to share with you all was it's about the direction of digitalization. And I think that what's important about this is um, this actually comes from LF networking and from ARPIT. And why it is valuable is to understand that what happened in telecommunications is also happening in energy. What you have is, you know, today or yesterday's black boxes, they're proprietary, the hardware and the software are, uh, you know, aggregated. And, um, and it makes it very difficult uh, to enable interoperability um, and to be able to drive innovation uh, uh, between vendors um, so that when you are managing a grid like a national grid or a state grid, um, you want to be able to have as much flexibility as possible um, to interoperate and to be able to use um, the products and services from many different vendors. And so where we're moving towards, you know, really the first call to action is around disaggregation. And the second is around software defined. And I think that that's where this community is really finding itself right now is really articulating this is what software defined infrastructure looks like. Those two things enable uh, uh, utilities, grid operators, aggregators, um, to be able to begin automating and to be able to begin providing virtual functions. And so that then takes us into this open source project based stack. And, and so this is, you know, um, when I showed you and I'm gonna, you know, in a, in a little bit, I'm gonna go back to that picture of um, all of the functions of the grid. There's no one architecture. 
it's not like you can look at cloud or you can look at telecommunications and you can have a very um, clear stack. Um, the stack is very different. And, but this gives us kind of a directional idea. This is where we're going. The second thing that is actually really new about energy is that you've got the edge and then you've got data centers. So you have the edge and you have cloud and, and then you have on-prem. And um, the other thing that's important to understand about energy is that time scales are really critical. And so that's some of the work that really has to be established in uh, the next five years, um, both with 5G and with cloud um, is around latency. Um, so that we can have um, cloud enabled uh, or uh, um, microservice enabled architectures that are able to rely on infrastructure for things that are critical. And, um, you know, in the energy world, you have the substation and uh, customer sided nodes um, that are then going through communication infrastructure, and then they are the, the data about them are moved out into system management um, and customer and markets. So I, um, you know, what I wanted to share with you about this is um, when we are talking about the grid of the future, there's, there's nobody out there in the world who is actually building the grid of the future and is just going to throw it over the wall and we're all gonna be saved. Instead, in order to be able to facilitate and enable electric mobility, to be able to transition to electric fuel, um, we are going to have to build um, the, the functionality of the grid. And that what you're seeing here, while it's a taxonomy, really, is um, a microservices view of the grid of the future. And when you're looking at it, you know, you recognize that smart contracts, smart ledgers are totally different than um, protocol conversion or, you know, asset monitoring or state estimation or cross-border capacity calculation. All of those things are so completely and wildly different. Um, but, you know, the other thing that you have is that in the grid of the future or in the energy systems of the future, part of what we're going to be able to do is compose new, um, uh, new various different solutions and architectures. So one of the things that uh, Dr. Catano is going to talk about is around uh, the Sony uh, microgrid, DC microgrid, which is, you know, has many parts of this. So really building these architectures um, and composing them is going to be uh, so much about what the future um, is going to require from us. And uh, the projects that you see here, um, part of what I did was I mixed it up a little bit so that uh, you could see the, the blue ones are the projects that are coming in in December and January. Uh, the yellow one has already been accepted and we just don't have the logo for it. And, and then you have um, three other projects that uh, folks are working on around data, around cybersecurity and around fault localization. And we see those in planning and uh, coming forward. So I hope that this is a, some context for understanding uh, the projects within LF Energy. Um, I had the great uh, distinct pleasure of being able to introduce um, Hiroaki Kitano. And he is an executive vice president of the Sony Corporation where he is also the officer in charge of AI collaboration. Additionally, Dr. Kitano is the president and chief executive officer of Sony Computer Science Labs. Dr. Katano's interests are wide and broad. He has completed studies in computational biology, artificial intelligence, massively parallel computers, autonomous robots, systems biology. And for today, he will share with us about open energy systems and the work Sony Computer Science Labs has been doing in microgrids. 
to just give you a little bit of sense of how this is going to work, um, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Catano. Um, and then uh, he is the only live presentation. Um, we can take uh, questions during this time. Um, you can put uh, questions into the Q&A um, and uh, we will do our best to answer them. And, um, and then I will come back on and we can have a conversation if there are questions that people want to cover. Um, and then, uh, and then how I would, and then I will introduce the next one, which is the grid exchange fabric, and uh, and I can take questions um, if you have them, uh, and then we will play the next one. Um, so we can kind of go back and forth. We specifically chose uh, this format so that we could have some more connection and that the attendees could actually participate more. So if you're okay with that, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Catano and I am going to put myself on mute um, and stop my video, but I am here and, uh, and I will uh, hand this over. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Suri. Uh, maybe uh, let me uh, share my slide, I guess. Uh, okay, I'll share this. Perfect. Okay, uh, good morning for people in Asia, good afternoon, uh, other place, uh, or good night, another place as well. Uh, I'd like to share with you today uh, is our experience in the open energy system, uh, which is a, a decade long uh, uh, project. At the same time, at the end, I would like to uh, briefly uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, discuss about like uh, you know one of the potential projects we are currently discussing in LF Energy. Okay, so uh, our recognition is like uh, we are in the uh, transformation phase of the civilization, as you mentioned, and uh, we are very much shocked with the uh, the reality. Uh, although the uh, lockdown, global lockdown, the COVID, like environmental. Uh, you know, uh, issue has not been solved. I mean, it just like uh, uh, reduced the carbon dioxide loading uh, about like a 10 year uh, time frame, but like uh, now it's pretty much go back to the as uh, we have before. So we need a qualitative change in the uh, energy landscape and then also like a structure of the industry. And in the Sony Computer Science Lab, we've been working on a broad area of research, including global agenda, which is more the climate issues, not global medical issues, and agriculture, and cybernetic industry, which is basically the AI and data science and the human augmentation like a creativity and a physical augmentation uh, thing like that. And the focus uh, uh, pre predominantly our activity in sustainability is an area of the global agenda uh, domain. And uh, we are running a few projects, not just like energy projects. One of the projects that we're working on very aggressively is the called the cynical culture, which is a new kind of agriculture promoting a biodiversity and the stability of the EU and then try to reduce the income gap in the people in Africa and in the part of the Asia. And also like apply for the uh, industrial countries for like uh, uh, urban agriculture or a new form of agriculture. And we have an off energy system, which I'm gonna talk about, a distributed grid system. And they also have like a high performance network uh, project in the space, which is like we use the uh, uh, laser beam, uh, laser to actually be able to communicate broadband, you know, high through, uh, high, uh, you know, broadband uh, network uh, in a space for uh, for the low orbit satellite network uh, as well. We can combine them together to create like a global ecosystem for you know helping the uh, you know uh, global uh, climate issues. Okay, so uh, our project in the energy uh, goes back to well over ten years. Initially, we had the uh, very interesting prototype like uh, in internet of the electricity, and then we brought the system. Uh, into the Africa uh, to show like, uh, you know, to electrify the uh, part of the Africa. And initial project, which you can see is actually public viewing for the FIFA World Cup when Sony was the sponsor there. And then uh, we brought the electricity and work with WHO uh, to do the vaccination of the people uh, in a part of the Africa as well. And then uh, we also have electrified Northern part of Ghana as a pretty much like a standalone system rather than a grid because like uh, in between the house was so distant and then I actually used was actually relative minimum. So it was okay to have like a standalone renewable system. At the same time, we use that system to deploy into the uh, Sierra Leone after the Ebola outbreak in West Africa a few years back. And uh, we helped them to uh, all the uh, medical professionals to able to get like a, 
uh, blood sample from the Ebola survivors uh, for able to for them to be able to uh, get a vaccine uh, development, which is going very well. And then, uh, if you uh, uh, you know uh, looking into the, all the COVID counteractions uh, in uh, Japan, uh, we have uh, worked with the Professor Kawaoka, renowned viro uh, you know virologist, and also Professor Nishiura, which is very became very famous in Japan or a COVID uh, uh, mathematical model. And then uh, after that, like uh, you know, work in uh, Africa, uh, we decided to bring the system as a grid uh, in Japan and in uh, industrial uh, countries. And then we thought about like a wide theoretical framework. I was involved in the uh, uh, you know World Economic Forum, uh, Future of Electricity Council, and then uh, Complex System Council. And then I, I was actually used to be advised for the outstorm in France as well. So we actually decided that we need to have a system uh, which is sustainable, resilient, and uh, economically uh, affordable and foster the growth. So the uh, our first project, which is actually the flagship project, the DC OES project in the OIST. Uh, as you can see, this is like a campus in Okinawa Science, Institute of Science and Technology in the mainland Okinawa, Southern Island in Japan. And uh, we, uh, put our uh, DC microgrid system in 19 faculty houses. Okay, those are the houses that the actual family living. Uh, it's not experimental house. Okay, so we had like a, you know faculty housing cluster, and now uh, we got the uh, you know put the OES uh, on that. Okay, so uh, this is actually the other picture and then how uh, we wired up. We actually wired up in a three uh, bus lines and then uh, uh, we get uh, all the status monitoring system and all that. So been operational for the last five years, uh, non-stop, uh, very reliable. And we increase it uh, over 10% uh, energy, renewable energy uh, utility ratio. And then uh, uh, this one specifically are configured to see how we can switch between the like, a main traditional grid line and the renewable uh, microgrid system. So like a uh, facility installed in a photo, so a photovoltaic, but it was relatively modest. It's not, with this one actually intentionally not uh, try to get 100% self-sufficiency or over 90%. We actually designed the system to be 60% self-renewable uh, and then 40% from the traditional grid. So we can see how we can switch back and how we can be, how we're gonna have like a regulatory hurdle uh, to be able to install this kind of system. Okay, that, that's a design and then a purpose. Okay, <clears throat> the system is basically an interesting uh, uh, a Linux based energy system. We have like a Hazel Cast, BioX, and then uh, uh, had like a, all the uh, control software, which is bas basically Linux based. And then we have an active kind of control. This is a kind of a trick we have. And uh, with a bus line, multiple peer-to-peer -peer electricity, uh, you know, the distribution, and that, that's really the key. And then we have an algorithm to be able to do that. And that, that uh, you know, you might have heard like a Sony decide to make it an open source. And that is exactly the component, which is a critical core part of the grid system. Basically, uh, you know, we our installation uh, in Okinawa, which we can have like a different installation, is basically each house had a sort of photovoltaic and a lithium ion based battery, and then uh, an energy router system or the battery control system, and then are connected with the multiple bus line. So we basically has the three bus lines in the A bus, two B, B bus, and C bus line, and then uh, they have like a star connections. Okay, that that the whole configuration in this experiment, we can have a different configuration, but like, uh, basically we actually have like a, uh, we can to get more technical materials and I don't think we're going to go into detail. Uh, basically, we got the uh, inter-house uh, communication uh, uh, connection as we set like a 350 ball. Reason is if you go up and like 400 ball, we have like a very different kind of component, which is very expensive. So we got to uh, decide to go for 350 ball. And if you have like uh, someone who some household who have like access to the uh, energy, uh, which is battery is almost full and still, uh, you know, PV is uh, generating electricity and there are some scarcity at other place. Uh, we're gonna have a gradient of, uh, you know, uh, voltage level and they got the current, uh, you know, uh, electric current going around. And then we have like a, a trick to be able to, uh, you know, enable uh, virtual peer-to-peer -peer, uh, redistributions. Okay, I'm not going into detail and there's all technical documents there. Okay, now we have like all the software stack, Linux base and a bigger one and then, uh, you know, and then all the APIs, which is like autonomous uh, power, power interchange uh, system uh, on top of that. And then uh, we're gonna have like all the hardware to comply with that. Do we have like all the uh, monitoring system or have all the control system uh, as well? 
Now, and then uh, what the reality we have, like in the five year experience, is like, uh, you know, as we all know, like, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, solar photovoltaic output as well. You know, by the time like uh, 10 a.m., usually, you know, battery get full and then we have to waste, uh, you know, rest. Okay. And then uh, in, in terms of the energy consumption, each household, as you can see in the uh, right side, uh, has a high variability. Okay. So it makes sense to be able to actually redistribute the energy. And this is uh, actually, uh, you know, energy utility pattern for the each household. And then uh, you can see the, a quite substantial variability on the patterns. And then, uh, you know, uh, this is the kind of actual data and simulations. The middle panel, uh, you know, is actual, uh, you know, data, how the thing can happen it's the middle and then uh third uh figure from the uh top and the middle row uh is actually how much the energy being uh exchanged we had the extensive energy exchange and uh, from like uh, 10 a.m to like uh 3 p.m as well i mean this is the time of like uh you know a lot of activity going on and a maximum so the photovoltaic generations and we can do the simulation on what happened if like there's no exchange we can just uh, cut off that we can actually convert the energy consumptions uh you know how much the how fast the battery can drain up things like that that that's in the uh, left panel and now with that uh, uh we can do the uh you know uh, recalculations you know what is the utility ratio in this configuration because we target for the 60 percent area of energy use and uh when the uh, consumption is about like a per day consumption is about uh, less than uh, 10 kilowatt hour and then uh we got the uh, uh about like a 40 to uh uh, you know, it's the uh, 80% like uh, energy, uh, renewable energy uh, ratio, uh, as opposed to the grid. So the grid is about less than, uh, uh, about like a 30% grid use, and then this is, uh, uh, you know, renewable. And if you got like a more, uh, like a two, uh, 20 kilowatt per hour, I think you know, it got stabilized into like a, a 30 to 40 uh percent uh renewable energy use and this is great because this is like a facility design actually uh so like i think it's the design uh you know moving as we design so and then uh from there we see the uh all, all the data and we can see like uh what is the effect of the uh, exchange so like, uh, among the you know entire consumption of the energy what is the actually the ratio that we use the uh renewable uh, that we found out like uh, you know depends 40 to 80 percent depends on the uh consumption and uh you know uh, months of the year uh, at the same time we go what is the effect of the uh energy exchange it's about like a 10 percent about like a, you know high single digit to a little over 10 percent uh among the energy consumptions uh energy demands were actually uh, uh you know uh saved sort of uh or, or like a uh, you know, what was due to the energy exchange. And then, you know, 10%, uh, it, it looks, it doesn't look like a really big, but I actually, if you go to like a high energy sufficiency, self sufficiency rate, uh, that's huge, actually. I mean, if it, this is actually the number uh, uh, figure, uh, depends on the each self sufficiency rate, okay. And then uh, uh, horizontal for each panel of the solar photovoltaic uh, size. And then uh, vertical is the battery size. Okay, if you look at like a, a self sufficient ratio, like uh, 99%. Uh, percent, so like uh, if you have like a 15 kilowatt, per kilowatt for solar photovoltaic, if you have to achieve 99%, percent, you have to have a quite substantial battery, which is about like, a, you have to get like 120 kilowatt hour battery. But if you got the energy exchange, you can do achieve by like a 20 five uh you know kilowatt hour body so like, which is actually substantial reduction under facility cost this is actually a different way of looking at it and if you try to get it it's 96 percent self-sufficient rate with the solar photovoltaic 10 kilowatt and then uh you know to do that with that energy exchange you need to have a 50 kilowatt hour batteries but you can actually achieve that with a 20 kilowatt hour battery size uh with exchange so this is like an initial quite substantial cost reduction and um, uh, the, and uh, with a three, uh, uh, you know, the size of the uh, family of uh, three to five, uh, which is in Okinawa's uh, facility, and a uh, practical size, you can put like a solar photovoltaic in a rooftop if you confine the rooftop. That's about like a nine seven point five to uh, nine kilowatt. That is actually a uh, practical size that you can put, uh, you know, solar photovoltaic. Uh, with that, if you want to achieve like over nine percent self sufficiency by the renewable, and you, I, you know. You know, you know, assume like a 10 kilowatt, and you have to have like a, with that exchange, you have to have 50 kilowatt hour 
a battery size, but I can actually reduce it 20 kilowatt, which is very practical size. Okay, that means that we can really calculate the cost reductions. Okay, so like we found out this is a very significant, and then uh, you know this is actually a diagram showing the control panel, monitoring panel, how energy exchange can be done, and then also like uh, and this is very resilient. Now you see uh, the diagram. Let me play back a little bit. Okay, this is my normal, and then you can just uh, uh, see. Uh, okay, so you see like, uh, you know, energy exchange going on, you know, and then I should say, okay, things are saving, what happened? Okay, we had a thunderstorm, I mean, we had lightning, and then our network disrupted. Okay, so we actually, uh, you know, communications are gone, and then those are the nodes which we can actually access for the network, and they are surviving network, and they are starting energy exchange by themselves. Okay, what happened to the node which disappeared? They actually move into the standalone mode. So like even in this case, no household got a blackout. Okay, even blackout. But like a surviving node, which is a network is connected, uh, telecommunications uh, internet was connected, still uh, alive, was able to keep going for the energy exchange, and all other go into the emergency standalone energy supply mode. So we have like a very resilient system uh, uh, going on. Okay, and then our track record is like we got the uh, quite substantial sufficiency ratio, and we verify the sharing provide a, a very effective uh, facility uh, cost saving as well, and in a very robust system. And then uh, everyone the thunderstorm, like a five year continuous support, and then uh, uh, we got the non stop. So like from historically, we start from the uh, standalone system in Africa, and they got to the uh, uh, microgrid system uh, operating uh, in, in Okinawa. So uh, we consider this is a very practical, battery proven system, and we decide to go move into the next stage, which is the open source. Okay, so because of the uh, recognitions, the uh, current uh, state speed of the renewable energy deployment is not enough. We, we, we see that in the COVID lockdown result. So we decided you know, we have to take a maximum measure to be able to speed up the uh, penetration of renewable microgrid system in a large scale. So we decided to you know open source and we decide to have the, the particularly the phase one we're gonna have like a three phase open source uh you know uh plan right now uh first phase is the core module of the able to have like an autonomous power redistribution system this has been really the core of the grid system and therefore we decide to uh, work with the rf energy and then all the discussion going on we can uh, benefit like a both and then we can have our technology to be used by the broader stakeholders and then have the wider penetrations and LF energy, ooh, I know our system can be one of the core piece of the entire portfolio of the technology, open source technology they are looking into. And then uh, we have been working on the DC, uh, DC system. At the same time, we may be able to expand this to the AC grid system as well. We have internal uh, sort of uh, validation that this can be done, but uh, we need to uh, work with other stakeholders to be able to expand into the DC AC grid as well so we can either have a choice over dc microgrid a dc ac hybrid and ac microgrid uh you know based on the technology we are providing i'm sorry i was a little mixture of the japanese and the, uh you know uh, english one but like we're actually going to uh broaden the horizon uh working with uh, lf energy uh to be able to uh, accommodate in a very different configurations okay so I uh, think it's still under discussion, nothing fixed yet, although we are getting the uh, a, a sort of a consensus on where we should be going. But a potential action plan, if we agree, is that yeah, first we want to have a basic hardware platform uh, comprised of OES and uh, APIs. Probably name can be changed there under the new project, but like, uh, uh, l l let's just use this name for, uh, for time being. And then are uh, consistent with the API that we provide. Uh, we need the hardware and we need the more software stack as well. Particularly in the hardware, you know, uh, the inverter is the issue. We want to have like an inverter, uh, which is comply with the uh, OES APIs API and affordable <coughs> and reliable and cost, you know, uh, inverter. Okay. And then a configuration case study, we have like, a, you know, Okinawa is one configuration that can be a different configuration. What would be the best configuration? What is the optimization? What is it, you know, we need a simulator optimizer for that. And then we need, a, uh, you know, suites of uh, software uh, to be able to do that. And then uh, from there, we can take a next generation system development uh, as well. We might be the, uh, a normal expansion to the uh, current version as well, or we might redesign that, that we don't know, but like, uh, you know, for this kind of system to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, widely penetrating, you know, but this because of energy system, software alone is not going to do that. You know, software can be open source, but uh, we need 
basic, uh, you know, common stable hardware platform, which is very important. We need help on this. I mean, we can build ourselves, but at the same time, uh, we like to have like a, a you know hardware vendor, uh, you know, uh, to be able to uh, help us uh, creating a standard hardware set as well. Uh, of course, like Sony has been the uh, you know member of the open source community, particularly the Linux Foundation for many years. When different projects were, we can see, and this will be the, uh, if we agree, this can be a yet another addition, uh, particularly in the energy front. And then I hope like we can work together uh, for the sustainable future. Thank you very much, and I would like to uh, answer any questions you have you might have. Wow, that was great. That was really, really great. Thank you so much. Um, I I am so excited and thrilled by this because I, I think that um, when I, when I conceive of microgrids, there's not one kind of microgrid, and I and um, you know because if if you have a campus, let's say microgrid, or you have a commercial and industrial microgrid. Um, when you imagine how things are going to scale and change in, you know, how, how do you, do you see us taking this as being a core and then building around it? Um, you know, it, it kind of, I, I'd be very curious what your thoughts are about what the best way to do this would be. Yeah, well, actually, that's a great point. Actually, it's like uh, you know, our experience is relatively limited in a small number of cases studied. Obviously, we can't really do the all kind of thing. So, like uh, you know, we understand the nature of the uh, DC microgrid system and in and a specific con configuration. But uh, obviously, like uh, there are different demands, different kind of configuration requires. Like uh, we have like a uh, every house to have a rooftop, but like, uh, you know, that's not always the case. Like I uh, said, people might have like a, a three to four different, uh, you know, power generation station, uh, you know, solar photovoltaic or biomass or, uh, you know, uh, other uh, system uh, in uh, off of the village, for example, off of the residential area, but still wants to connect and still wants to configure as a microgrid system. But that's different configuration. Or other people might have like a hybrid, some rooftop and uh, some, uh, you know, you know, of uh, uh, semi-centralized like uh, power generations. And then now uh, we assume uh, our system used the uh, lithium ion battery for now, but uh, of course we can have a fuel cell or like a hydrogen based uh, or other kind of uh, energy storage, which might come in the future. So like, uh, you know, open energy system, open means open to the uh, various uh, renewable energy source and the storage capability. Now we add to the open means and open source as well, which is uh, very nice actually. But so like, I think all we need to do is uh, try out the different configurations. And also uh, what we have done is about like a 20 households, like uh, we know we can actually scale up to 30, 40, but like if you got like, a, you know, a thousand house for, we might have to have like a hierarchy, you know, design. We might have like a, a you know, a bunch of like a, you know, a, a microgrid clusters, and then uh, in between they're connected with the, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, some uh, trunk, you know, uh, different kind of grid architecture, or like a high voltage DC uh, as well. Depends on how you configure. So we want to maintain the maximum flexibility configuration capability. And I think we, our system is capable of doing that, but we just need the more stakeholder getting involved and try out in different uh, I think at the same time, uh, the other thing is very important. We would like to have a stable supply chain on the basic hardware. For example, like a battery, battery management system hardware, in butter, which is actually much more difficult than people think, as uh, much less like a, a supplier for the in butter. And then uh, we need reliable, uh, you know, AC, DC, DC, AC, DC, DC in butters. And that, that's really the critical, which kind of standardized that that would be great. And uh, we have all the monitoring software uh, as well. So like that uh, depends on the uh, uh, use case, we can probably modify that as well. So I think we need to uh, build the ecosystem around this. And we have like uh, experience doing that, but like, uh, you know, uh, you know, this kind of thing, we can't really do it alone. I mean, uh, you know, you just have a beautiful slide. I mean, going alone is not the way. And, and that's why we are decided to go open source and then uh, uh, wants to uh, work with the, uh, all the other uh, stakeholders and people who is uh, uh, interested in uh, saving the, this planet. I, I love how you think. So um, when peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, trading um, is, uh, clearly, what you discovered, you, you know, your data, is that 
uh, having uh, more together, not just a yeah. single household, but yeah. more together, actually created uh, a more efficient economic, e economically right. speaking, and yeah. using of energy. Yeah. It, it used it much more efficiently. So, but, uh, you know, do you, tell me about like how you developed your peer-to-peer -peer, um, model, because it's very yeah. unique, and, uh, and, and so I'm really interested in it. Yeah, so we have a relatively simple peer-to-peer -peer, like a uh, request and receive uh, electricity kind of sy uh, system. That's not a very sophisticated one because we can actually build up like a very sophisticated control on top of a system. But like uh, we are currently assume like uh, if a battery level actually go down a certain level, for example, like a 25% or something, then uh, you know, uh, the household uh, system as you guess, uh, I need more electricity. And then, uh, you know, then, uh, you know, some other system which actually likely to be the full charge or like, uh, likely to be a full or even like a, you know one actually wasting uh, because they can't restore anymore uh will keep uh you know for, uh, the matchmaking and then uh you know for decide to go who gonna provide to the who and then actually the real electricity wise well, electrons doesn't really flow that way i mean uh, we have like uh, all the network wise aggregations and redistributions so like uh, actually the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, negotiation it is actually virtual and the actual electrons is not necessarily actually move that way. So like, uh, right, you know, we haven't right. done actually do the uh, trading mechanism, like, uh, you know, all the uh, cryptocurrency, whatever people talking about, but like uh -huh. uh, we can actually uh, put that on top of that. You know, at the same time, what we found out is like, uh, uh, usually this kind of household, like a 20 kilowatt hour is a pretty much like an average consumption level with high variability. Okay, what will be the big challenge with the uh, EV? We haven't done like uh, too much of the EV, we, although we have a uh, data. It's like uh, Nissan Mirai uh, actually, uh, well, I, I was, Mirai was Toyota, I was forget about like uh, Nissan's uh, EV or Toyota's EV is about like a 40 to uh, 60 kilowatt hour, uh, you know, uh, battery. Okay, that is, uh, that's actually it's already double the size of the, you know, consumption of average household per day. Okay, and Tesla is about 70 kilowatt hour. So like a Tesla is actually consuming, uh, you know, if you charge a Tesla for full, uh, it is requires a three household whole day energy consumption level. So like a, a, with the penetration of EV running around, residential area for sure will be really swinged by the how people charge electric vehicle. So like, uh, you know, for like a, this energy exchange will be even more effective because we're gonna have like a much bigger variability depends on the traffic patterns or the mobilities now when and how people charge electricity to the EV. So like, I think like uh, this uh, OES, like energy exchange system has a higher value if you have a bigger penetration than EV in the household. Huh, so um, have, have you all talked with um, your utilities about about their plans with electric mobility and around charging and how you could optimize the system for charging? Yeah, I mean, uh, some utilities are very interested and uh, we are also talking with them uh, as well. Uh, although the Japanese are actually a regional monopoly and then although they are opening up uh, a little bit with like uh, emerging uh, utility uh, companies uh, as well, but they actually work as a more or less a negotiations rather than the power generation, a real infrastructure holder. Uh, but I guess they're still mm -hmm. interesting in, and then uh, also like uh, probably not just outside of Japan, I think they are quite substantial interest, uh, although like uh, we need like a partner to be able to penetrate in that uh, market because like uh, this is like, uh, you know, core infrastructure of each country. So you can't really just go on, yes. hey, we're going to build them. So like, uh, you know, so one of the reasons we're going to open source is to ensure the, uh, you know, availability of the, uh, you know, technology and to ensure uh, that this is going to be more secured one because like, uh, you know, people can actually tap in and people can ha have like a multiple source. And then uh, even if it's only decide not to, uh, able to continue, like uh, people can take over, you know, people can carry on. And of course, we are not really planning to, you know, shrink down the activity as well. But, uh, you know, of course, like uh, you want to be sure that, the, uh, you know, this is going to be there. It's not going to evaporate, you know, uh, by the individual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Companies. Like, yeah. So I think uh, this is a, a really uh, interesting opportunity. Uh, you know, if people want to go to renewable in a big way, 
uh, I think uh, you can't really do the uh, conventional grid because of the uh, you know stability issues. So like if they can have like a, a microgrid system around the renewable, they can absorb the uh, perturbations by microgrid and they can keep the main grid very stable. And I, I think that is probably a very practical configuration in a big way. Yeah, I, I agree. So I, I have one more question and then I, you know, I want to really open it up to the audience. I mean, part of why we chose this is so people could interact with you. Um, what, what is the relationship of uh, the assets at the edge? Um, in, in other words, when people talk about the grid of the future, they often talk about arbitrage out at the edge, um, yeah. kind of you know, this industrial IoT edge um, in which you have devices that are either loads or resources to the grid or you know, to the energy power systems um, communicating with each other. How did you all design that? so that they were talking. And um, are they talking to a central system or are they actually communicating amongst themselves at the edge um, with some sort of prioritization uh, in terms of how they load, uh, you know, leader election, stuff like that? Oh, yes. Uh, uh you know, and basically it's a peer to peer. We can have like a central monitor or central conduit if you want. But like basically when they have like a, among the all the connected nodes, you know, we actually decide one uh, leader, one control center, which should be dynamically reassigned. Okay, when you have like a, you know, one control center, they will take a control of that part of the grid. And uh, if anything happened to the center or like we decide to dynamically configure, other node will take the leadership. That will be the control center. So, you know, and then every software has, a, you know, same capabilities. So we can actually dynamically switch. And that's the reason why the, in a, you know, in you know, a lightning case, you know, uh, network disrupted. Okay, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, kind of a uh, bus line B and C was detached. Okay, at that time, like uh, assume like a uh, leader was in the bus line C node, for example, one of the uh, household uh, system in the bus line C, and that was detached. Okay, A survived. Then a new leader emerged in between the A node, you know, A bus, like among like a five household, and then uh, they took this guy took over, and then uh, you know start controlling locally. Yeah, so like, if like, uh, you know, at that time, like a uh, bus line B and C internet was completely down so that they got self-sufficiency. But if like, uh, you know, disintegrate, but still they are like a B surviving by themselves, C surviving by themselves, they have like a each, they can have like a leader and they'll control locally. So this is like a fully autonomous system and dynamically reassigning the control center. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm 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 really excited uh, for us. So, uh, anyone uh, in the audience, any questions? Um, would you like to unmic? Do you want to? I, I I actually don't know if that's possible, but can you? If you want to raise your what hand or put a question in. Okay, we have a shy group of people. Um, well, I. I uh, Katana-san, I, I am just, I couldn't be more pleased and, and more, um, the only thing that would be better is to be there with you uh, and in person. And um, I uh, pray and hope that, that we will be able to do that in the very near future. Um, and I, I look forward to working with all of you. Um, uh, Janusi-san or uh, Kawamoto-san, do you have anything that you want to add um, as the uh, as as the team that is bringing this uh, into open source? Nope. Hi, Shuri. Uh, this is Kotaro speaking. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes, Kotaro, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. Thank you for your time uh, for us to you know, share what we have done and what we are going to do. And we really, as uh, Kitano-san mentioned, we, uh, you know, one of the key, our key points is to work with uh, you know, the uh, many stakeholders outside Sony uh, Computer Science Lab, please. And we are very excited to working with all of you joining this you know, uh, conference. And let's uh, discuss together how, how we will you know, expand what we have and what you have to realize, you know, the decarbonization uh, in uh, decarbonization network and the future of the grid network. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm hearing that very loud and clear, and I, I hope that the audience is hearing that too. Um, uh, I, you know, at the very end, I'm, I'm going to give all my information. Um, clearly, you can go to the LF Energy website um, very shortly. Uh, I hope by the end of the year um, that the project will be a part of LF Energy and uh, that you will be able to, if you come to the website, um, to join the mailing list, get the code um, and uh, participate. We really are um, I, you know, looking for the hardware manufacturers. Um, you know, I, one of the conversations that we've had as a group as, as we were bringing the software on board and Sony was joining is, um, you know, really the conversations with, for instance, the World Bank um, and the UN and others who have uh, really, you know, maybe the world has a, a thousand or 1500 or 2000 microgrids a year are getting built. I mean, they're really not a lot of them. It, it's kind of like we're in the very early days. Um, but I think that everybody believes that moving forward that there are going to be tens of thousands of these. And so it's absolutely critical that we build a relationship between the software and the hardware um, vendors um, so that we can begin to have the, a kind of interoperability um, in terms of scaling and plug and play so that you can go into an African vi village or you can go into Southeast Asia or you can go to North America, to California that desperately needs microgrids and, and basically be able to stand it up very quickly. Um, so we need you all to participate and I really look forward to the next year with you all. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to um, move us along here. Um, and uh, so the the very next um, video. So what, what we did was we offered to our TAC um, to folks to be able to uh, produce videos because I, I think everyone knows that it's very difficult because the world is round uh, to get um, uh, North America, Asia, and uh, Europe all together. So what they did was that they recorded videos of um, their software. And the first software that we're going to queue up is uh, called the Grid Exchange Fabric. And we brought this software into LF Energy in February of 2020. And uh, the, the person who's gonna talk about it is Jonas Van Den Bogard. And uh, Jonas is also um, a representative to the governing board. Um, he is a, a, the PAC chair. He is a wonderful um, human being and a really terrific engineer. And uh, so he is going to tell the story about grid exchange fabric. Uh, Teo, you can bring up the video now, please. Hi everybody, it's really great to be here and be part of the Open Source Summit in Japan. Let's start with a quick introduction. I'm Jonas van Bogart, the solution architect at Aliander and one of the key experts on the Grid Exchange Fabric platform. And this talk is all about about the Grid Exchange Fabric platform, also called GXF, an open source industrial IoT platform initiated by Aliander, the largest distribution system operator in the Netherlands. Aliander has over 3 million customers and manages over 8,000 kilometers of electric electricity grid and manages over one point two billion assets and has over 7,000 employees. GXF is a generic 
industrial IoT platform built for organizations that manage and control large-scale infrastructures. It helps to create maximum business value with the implementation and use of smart devices. After this talk, you will understand the value of the GXF platform, its unique open source approach. And also you will get to know how to get involved in the GXF community. We will start off with the key challenges of a distribution system operator like Alienda. Next, I will introduce the key use cases of the GXF platform. After which, we will dive into the architecture of the GXF platform. I will highlight its key features and talk about you about the roadmap. And at the end, we also share how you can get involved. Now let's get started. Due to global developments and innovations, the way we generate, distribute and use energy is changing rapidly. Fossil fuel power stations will close down in order to reduce CO2 emissions. We see a strong increase in the use of renewables. For example, the number of solar panel and wind energy is growing very rapidly. And also the number of electric cars is growing exponentially. And this has a huge impact on the electric, electric grid. And therefore distribution system operations like Alienda faces major challenges to support this transition. And projects like GXF can really help organizations like Alienda. Before we discuss the architecture and its key features, let's take a look at the use cases of GXF. And I would like to show you a short video which introduces one of the key and first key use cases of the platform in more detail. As far back as the 70s, public lighting in the Netherlands has been switched using the ripple control technique, a centralized system that these days has become obsolete. It results in more disruptions and is becoming more expensive in maintenance. Alianda believes that this present system no longer meets today's needs and requirements, and neither does it use the technical possibilities available at this moment that are also being further developed. Public lighting does not stand alone, but as an integral part of public spaces. It plays an important role in people's quality of life and security in areas and districts. Lighting as an entity is becoming more sustainable, whereby municipalities are becoming more conscientious in deciding at what time and what degree of lighting is desired or deemed necessary. Sustainable lighting not only results in less energy usage, but eventually in lower costs. This fits in with the current philosophy among municipalities and provinces, aiming to increase the sustainability in their areas and districts. Municipalities are not alone in this. More and more citizens wish to become involved in the development of their own environment and public spaces. New forms of collaboration between citizens and commercial parties will result in new innovative products and services that will improve their overall quality of life. Within the public space, we all notice that energy networks are becoming ever smarter and that objects and applications are making more and more use of internet technology, are wirelessly connected and can be remotely controlled with smart applications. This results in different types of information on public spaces becoming within reach, which increases the interaction with the environment. In the area of public lighting, municipalities and provinces would like to control switching and dimming by themselves and thus not being dependent on one or another supplier. As well as this, the public lighting needs and requirements differ greatly per region, district or city. This is why Alianda wants to actively support municipalities and provinces in the transition to flexible switching systems of public lighting. 
The starting out point is that municipalities have a maximum amount of freedom in choosing which applications they use for controlling which objects. Municipalities can therefore get more in control through themselves controlling switching times and dimming regimens, resolve power failures faster through up-to-date information, and save on costs through energy saving and more efficient maintenance and management. Alianda offers as a solution an open, generic, scalable and independent platform that makes flexible switching of public lighting possible and will support more public facilities in the future. This I hope this video gave you some background on why Alianda initiated the GXF platform. And to give you an idea of the skill we use this today, Aliena is successfully using GXF to operate and control over 20,000 switch devices and control over 700 streetlights. And GXF allowed us to use switch devices for multiple vendors that use different protocols and different communication standards. However, Public lighting is not the only use case GXF is used for today. For example, GXF is also actively used for metering to retrieve metering data from hundreds of thousands to millions of smart meters. Also, GXF is used for infrastructure management, for remote device configuration, device management and over-the-air firmware updates. And furthermore, we believe GXF in the future can also play a role in, for example, load management to dynamically adjust and control the electric grid via edge nodes in the network, for example, to smooth out peaks of solar farms or peaks of in wind farms. And also, GXF can be used in the future for microgrid management to monitor and control microgrids. And also we believe that GXF can be applied for many more use cases, we even not aware of today. Now let's dive into the architecture. By using GXF, you can monitor and control your smart devices within your infrastructure. And from more an, an abstract level, the platform could be seen as an industrial IoT platform. And one of the main principles of the platform is its modular design and support of state-of-the-art security standards. For example, the platform has zero trust principle implemented, which means all communication to and from devices is encrypted. All communication to and from applications encrypted. Also, GXF has a full audit trail to see who did what at what time. And in order to support a high number of devices, GXF allows high scalable implementations, both in the cloud and also in an on-premise situation. And to give you an idea of the scale, GXF is already used to monitor and control over 700,000 streetlights. And GXF is built in mind to control and monitor over 10 million, 10 million devices. And best for last, GXF is also open source. Why open source? Because we believe that open source and open standards prevent lock-in and provides a tremendous opportunity to collaborate. GXF has a layered architecture. And let me walk you through these layers. IT applications, are connected to the service domain via an integration layer. 
And this integration layer contains web services, for example, to allow easy integration with applications. The service domains contains business logic of a specific domain, such as public lighting or smart metering, for example. The core layer of the platform routes the messages to the correct protocol adapters and contains generic functionalities to support device management, time synchronization, and firmware management, for example. Next, the protocol adapters in the protocol layer convert the messages to a command that is supported by a specific smart device. And this command could be any command the smart device support. For example, retrieving the energy usage stored in the smart meter or switching command which switches on the street lights. Next, have a look at the GXF roadmap. Currently, we are working on the new GXAP website. Also, we are working on integrating GXAP with, with Kafka, and we started with doctoriz the do doctorization of the platform. Also, we are working hard on improving the MQT adapter, and also we are making general code improvements to further improve the quality and stability of the platform. And also in 21, we as Alienda continue to improve and extend the platform. For example, we plan to finalize the doctorization of the platform, also improve the ECA 104 adapter, improve the release management process of the platform to make it more transparent for the open source community, and also have planned many more code improvements to further improve performance, stability, and quality. Of course, this roadmap is not set in stone, and we always welcome contributions and ideas from the open source community. And talking about contributions from the open source community, let's talk about how you can join the GXF community. The complete code base of GXF is available on GitHub under the Apache 2.0 license. And you can find the link on this slide. Also, there's extensive documentation available on how to use the platform, how to install it, and how to contribute to the platform. And also check out our new website and the GXF webinar from my colleague Robert Tussveld for even more detailed information on GXF. And I welcome you all to join us in the open source community. And also don't hesitate if you have any questions or feedback to contact us. You can contact us and stay in contact with us via the GXF mailing list. And the email address of this mailing list is on the slide. And also we have an issue tracker in case you run into an issue. Thank you very much for your time and interest, and I hope to hear from you soon. Thank you very much. That that was really great. Um, before we move on, are there, I, you know, I see that um, Bhaskar has some questions. <clears throat> um, I, I think uh, questioning about whether there's enough um, distributed energy resources to produce the energy that we need. And I, I think that um, there are many indications that in fact, we are able to do that. Um, whether you're using the wind in uh, <clears throat> Europe or hydro um, in many countries run renewable and hydro. Uh, 
and solar panels or industrial solar. Um, but I think that we're going to have to get creative. So it's not that, um, that distributed and renewable energy can't uh, produce enough electrons. Um, they're becoming increasingly efficient. And we also need to become more efficient with how we use energy. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more down the road about open e meter, but um, we need to consider that it's not just that we have a proliferation of renewable energy devices, but that we also have uh, radical energy efficiency. Um, <clears throat> Anne Tilloy and John Harper are running a project called Possible. And um, Possible stands for Power System Blocks. And Power System Blocks are six different um, uh, blocks that RTE developed um, to be able to uh, model and show uh, the French grid, um, both for regulators and also for planning purposes. So I'll be really interested to see um, how um, possible has evolved over the last year. And uh, Tail, please queue up the next video. Hi, everybody. I'm going to present you Possible Library. I'm Anne. I'm community manager and the developer of that project. I'm working for RT, the French TSO. We use Possible to model our power grid. Possible is an open source set of power system blocks written mainly in Java, dedicated to grid analysis and simulation. Possible is a project of the Linux Foundation Energy since two years. It is licensed under Mozilla Public License version 2.0. We are hosted on GitHub at www.github.com slash possible. The community involves 77 people. Well, is production ready? It offers a set of features for grid modeling and simulation. For example, you can use Possible to create a state-of-art application able to handle a variety of formats, such as CGMS for European Data Exchange, to perform power flow simulations and security analysis on the network, or to display single line diagram of the substation you can have in your network. All the features for grid modeling and simulations are fully described in our website. Here, here you have a full description of the grid modeling and a full, ex ex a full description of how you can extend the grid modeling for your specific needs. You can find here all the grid exchange formats that we support. So for example, we support also PSSC formats, high triple E, mad power, you can perform a lot of simulations with possible, like power flow, security analysis, or time domain simulation. For that part, we rely on an open source project called, Din called Dinawo. Possible offers some advanced features like high performance computing or data management as a time series management or database management. We also provide a set of microservices around the blocks. You can have also with possible a Python binding 
to make some proof of concept around possible. A key feature of possible is its modular design at the core of the open source approach. It enables developers to extend or customize its feature by providing their own plugins. You can see here our roadmap. It is what we expect to do next year. And here you have the community. The community exchange on Spectrum for questions and issues. And you, can, you have here uh, our Slack for more daily conversation. If you want to participate to our public technical steering committee, please have a look at our LFE calendar to join. Possible is already used in a number of projects. You have Farao. Farao is an open source modular toolbox for power system coordination process. Dinawo is an open source time domain simulation tool for power systems using the Modelica language. And GridSuite is a suite of web-based tools for grid simulation analysis. And my colleague Jon is going to present that tool to you. Hello everyone, I'm John, a developer from the GridSuite project. GridSuite is an open source project developed at github.com slash gridsuite. Please come and check it out. The goal of the project is to build upon the Pausible project and offer easy to use tools used to perform many different tasks that are needed to run coordinated electricity grids such as the European electricity grid that we're seeing right now on the screen. Today, I'll be giving you a brief tour of our first tools and we'll talk a bit about how we make them. Let's start with the grid study tool currently on screen, which is displaying a beautiful map of the European grid. It's got colors to differentiate between the different voltages and you can zoom and pan and even get this stunning European view. Okay, let's switch to the French network now. We see here a list of available networks in different formats, uh, for example, CGMES, CGMES or UCT. Uh, right now we're displaying the map with a dark theme and straight lines between the substation substations. Let's switch it over to a lighter theme and to lines drawn by the GPS positions of all pylons in the line. And now we have the whole view of the French network with accurate GPS positions for all the lines. We can even get a feeling of how the power is flowing through the network when zooming in and seeing the little arrows that are animated along the lines. To get this smooth map with 60 FPS animated arrows, we use the awesome library called DeckGL, which uses WebGL under the hood to get the performance. On this map, we can simplify things to get a better overview by displaying only the higher voltage levels and by hence showing the French backbone, electricity backbone. On the left side, we get a list of the substations in the network, which in which we can search for one substation using this filter, which is really fast. And we can ask for substation single line diagrams, where you see the different voltage levels of the substation or for only one voltage level. Grid study is a tool to explore networks, so we allow interacting with these single line diagrams, for example, by clicking on these breakers, which will toggle them. It will open closed breakers and close open breakers. The grid suite is also 
a collaborative tool. So we allow sharing links to our work to work with colleagues. Let me open this link in another browser to simulate another colleague working with me on this case. The link brings him directly to the same substation as the one I was looking at. Notice two things about this single line diagram. It's got only one voltage inside this whole voltage level, which has a computed value of 243 kilovolts. And it's got on this line, 77 megawatts of power going out. As a first demo, I'm going to click on this breaker. I will open this breaker and disconnect the two bars from one another. This should trigger the topology recomputation on the fly and it should be visible immediately live in my window, in my browser window where I click on the breaker, as well as in the other browser where my colleague Bob is just watching. Here we go. The, the app now shows us that we have two voltages, one with the light green and one with the dark green, but their values are unknown yet. This is because the app has, already, has only recomputed the, top, the topology, but not all the electrical values. To recompute all the electrical values, we need to run uh, an electrical simulation. The simplest kind of electrical simulation is called a load flow simulation and it computes the steady state of the voltage and power throughout the grid based on the constraints of the power plant's production targets and the consumer's demand. Let me also open this breaker here which should, after we recomputed the values, show that the power is no longer 77 megawatts going through this line but instead it should be zero because the line has become disconnected. Let's run the load flow. The load flow is of course delegated to possible and here we see the logs of the computation. And now we see the updated value of zero. To run this load flow, we use the possible framework and we ship the code from possible in Docker containers that we deploy either in a Kubernetes cluster, which is what we use to run our public demo at demo.possible.org, or for simpler deployments like the one I have now using Docker Compose. This is what we're seeing with these logs. To get live feedbacks on all operations, we use an asynchronous architecture and send messages through, through brokers like RabbitMQ and through WebSockets back to the browser. For the servers, we chose a stateless approach because it gives us a lot of power to easily develop new features. It is such a powerful model because any computation can fail and be picked, out, be picked off by another process where it left off. All computations are stored in a database as soon as they're done. We're using a scalable database as well. We use Cassandra. So we're confident that our platform can be used by many users at the same time. Deploying a new version is easy as well because there's no state in our code, so we can just replace the previous version with the new one. Everything is persisted in the database. And that's how our continuous integration and employment works, by taking merges to the master branch on GitHub and triggering GitHub actions that end up recreating pods in the Kubernetes cluster. Okay, back to the app. In addition to the geographical map, we can see a table of all the elements in the network. And this table killing can even allow you to interact with uh, the elements, for example, by setting new targets for productions and rerunning simulations. 
we can also see the results from the simulations. Low flow simulations are not the only simulations that you can run. Another type of simulation is, is the security analysis. Running a security analysis means checking one by one for a list of predefined contingencies whether or not they affect the network. For example, in this case, I could ask for the platform to run a, a simulation for in case each of the lines of the 400 kilovolt lines in the network had a problem. So this would mean running for this network 867 contingencies and getting results on which lines when they have a problem cause disruptions in the network. I'm not going to do it because for this you need more than the simple Docker Compose deployments or else it will take a very long time. Speaking of predefined contingency lists, we made a very simple app that allows you to create them. It's very simple because it's based on the possible contingency domain specific language. We use React, the front end JavaScript uh, framework to make these apps and it's really fast to build. Here we see the contingency that I used earlier. It's only a few lines of code because Pausible makes it very easy to write those contingencies. The, a real groovy script that uses the Pausible contingency DSL, domain specific language. One last task that is useful in coordinating networks is to get network data is to get network data from the different grid operators that are connected together and verify that their individual or individual grid models are coherent and can be merged together in a merged grid model and that and that this model is also stable using a load flow stimulation so we have this tool called grid merge which will run this kind of workflows as soon as grid operators publish their data let's simulate the publishing of the data by grid operators and see what happens in the app Here, this script will simulate the publishing of the data. So we see here that the app received a network and is running a low flow on it. So it's light blue until the low flow determined that it's correct. Now it's gotten dark blue because the low flow on this network said it was okay. The same happened for the next network and now the networks have been merged together and the load flow has been run and green means OK. We see the process uh, being repeated uh, every hour as our script is simulating the data sent by grid operators. Receiving, computing, receiving the second one in an instant, receiving the second one, computing the load flow on the second one, and then computing the load flow on the merged network. Okay, that's it for the demo today. In the future, we plan to make more tools that, are co that cover more of the tasks needed to run an electrical grid and, uh, and improve the current tool tools as well. For example, we want to be able to quickly describe variants of networks that would be the same as switch, uh, opening a switch or closing a, opening a breaker or closing a breaker, but instead express the fact that we want to maybe add a substation or add a line between two substations or maybe change the demand uh, for power. We also want to add simpler ways to describe simple contingency lists where you don't have to resort to writing even a short and easy script. We would like to get uh, a GUI that will show you, that will help you sort of a wizard that will help you uh, creating contingency lists. For the grid merge tool, maybe getting more alerting and more uh, results would be a nice feature.
So maybe sending emails as soon as one uh, individual grid models fails the checks or something like that. These are just a few of the improvements that we're going to make. Please check out github.com slash grid suite regularly to see what we're up to. Thank you for watching. Bye. Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, I, I'm not sure if you, um, how many of you out there are actually doing grid modeling, um, but to recognize uh, the amount of, um, you know, assets that they're actually tracking that are being composed. And, you, you know, one of the core values, uh, the core paradigm of the grid is called inertia which is the ability to manage supply and demand. So, um, you know, this demonstration and this software it came out of RTE, which is a French transmission system operator. And, um, and that's the high voltage. And we're going to go to the completely opposite end um, with open EE meter, um, which is really looking at uh, behind the meter and how do you actually value uh, energy efficiency. Now, when you move to renewable energy, one of the things that we have to be able to do is manage flexibility and demand response. So the next two ones, open E meter and then open meter that come after it are really about how we manage flexibility um, so that we can continue to match supply and demand um, by making uh, choices uh, with regards to um, uh, <clears throat> perhaps decreasing demand um, when, uh, when uh, there are constraints on the system or increasing demand, um, for instance, when you have an enormous amount of sun. And, uh, and so those are issues which uh, are often referred to as the duck curve. And, and what you wanna be able to do is flatten the duck curve by increasing demand uh, during times when you have high solar and high penetration or high wind. Um, so open e meter is the the next one. Are, are there any questions about what uh, you all saw? What possible? I'm not sure I can answer it, but um, <laughs> I think it's a great project. Um, okay, so I'm going to keep going. Go to open e meter, and um, this is uh, Phil Nyo, and uh, this is a great story. So uh, take it away, Theo. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Impacts at the Meter. Um, really excited to be here at the Open Source Summit um, uh, remotely and uh, to tell you a little bit about the Open e Meter, which is a project that is near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, I've been building this uh, with, um, uh, my, uh, with a team at uh, LF Energy and at Recurve where I work. Um, and uh, excited to show you a little bit about how it works, um, the kind of problems that it solves, and uh, you know why we're open source, and um, what it might mean for you. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, this is going to be a fairly quick presentation, um, just to kind of give you the overview of um, where this fits in. Um, there is a, there are a lot of uh, very cool. Uh, uh, LF Energy projects out there, uh, many of which are presenting um, at the summit, and I, I'd, recur I'd encourage you to, to go see as many of those presentations as you can. Um, uh, so let me go ahead and, and uh, sort of open this with a discussion, which is um, at the center of any problem that, uh, or at, at the center of any solution that that uh, is kind of being proposed here is a uh, discussion of climate change. Uh, this is why we're here. Um, there are a lot of potential avenues into um, solutions for climate change and, um, and uh, each one of them is as important as the next. Um, and, um, and these problems are, are wide reaching. Um, there are, a lot of energy users, um, and there are a lot of things that affect our climate. Um, and um, 
every um, uh, we'll get into this a little bit more, but um, the open EU meter helps tackle only a small part of this. Um, and, um, and, and naturally in with such a which with such a big kind of um, problem, <laughs> no one no one solution is is ever really going to be um, uh, a and um, so we're going to need lots of things helping us to achieve our our climate goals, um, and that starts um, at the nation state level, um, and it goes um, uh, it, it is going to have to reach into every part of our of our lives probably, um, and it's going to require a lot of innovation. And there are a lot of technologies being developed to change the way that we generate energy and the way that we consume energy. Um, and um, and uh, the thing that we're gonna be talking a little bit more about today are buildings. Buildings cover the earth and buildings um, are used for so many different um, things uh, uh, ranging from industrial, uh, you know, processes to uh, commercial um, uh, outfits and uh, of, of every type imaginable, um, as well as resident, residences, single family, multifamily buildings. Um, uh, each of these are subject to uh, the conditions of, of the world and try to create an environment and, and give us the tools um, to, uh, live our lives and to, to get things done and they're extremely important um, and they use a lot of energy. And um, uh, the open EU meter um, helps us to understand how to quantify the impacts of, um, of energy on buildings. Um, but again, I'm getting ahead of myself uh, let me talk a little bit more first about kind of um, uh, uh, one other side of this, which which I think um, is relevant to um, uh, an understanding of of why the open e meter exists. Um, so grid problems are are multifaceted. Um, there are a number of factors that you have to consider um, when um, uh, trying to change the way that the grid operates. Um, and uh, that starts um, from the basic problem of needing to meet generation with supply or with demand, uh, meeting supply of these resources with demand. And really there are two prongs to any approach that may affect the grid. One is to change the way that energy is generated. Um, another one, and the one that's more relevant to the open E meter, is to change the, the way that energy is consumed. Um, and um, there are many approaches for that. Um, and um, but both of both of these come together in energy grids, uh, which are complicated um, and uh, Uh, include things like um, uh, peak energy usage periods, uh, weather events, which are um, which affect grid usage. So um, there was a day. I, I live in California. The day there was a day in California last year when to buy a uh, a megawatt of power, which usually costs around 30 US dollars, um, cost over a thousand dollars on the grid spot market. And um, these times which are most energy intensive for the grid are also the times which are most energy, which are most carbon intensive uh, for our planet. And, um, and furthermore, um, uh, uh, anybody who has <clears throat> uh, 
been around in the last you know, eight to nine months knows that we're in a global pandemic and that has also affected the way that the grid um, uh, uh, needs to supply energy to buildings uh, as people change their habits um, uh, to respect stay-at-home orders. So um, naturally in a complicated and uh, a complex sphere, there are also going to be uh, a range of kind of uh, technologies or um, approaches for fixing the problems that, that arise. Um, and many of these you've heard of, um, maybe some of these you haven't, um, but these um, are all trying to take a chunk out of a, a separate aspect of this problem. Um, uh, just to kind of go through some of these, um, if you want to affect demand, one way to change that demand is to change how much it costs, is to change the price of energy. Um, um, another way is to install solar panels at, um, at a site or to, in, in generation. Um, and uh, what I'm, what I'm, uh, by the way, what I'm focusing on here are some of the uh, uh, solutions which are which focus a little bit more on the on the demand side. Um, so uh, you could install solar panels um, at, at a specific building. You could install batteries. Uh, increasingly, um, batteries are being used uh, to support the grid not only at utilities but also. Uh, distribute at, at um, sites around the grid uh, as individual building owners uh, can use batteries to consume energy when it's less carbon intensive um, or less expensive for the grid um, and, um, and to rely on their battery stored power uh, to shift load from certain times of day to other times of day um, when it's less impactful. Um, there are programs which um, send signals to users, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about um, de uh, demand response programs um, that ask people to turn off uh, large appliances uh, or industrial processes at particular times of uh, day when there are um, extreme weather events, which will only become more frequent in the future. Um, and then there are a whole host of approaches for, for improving the, the efficiency of buildings. Um, at the industrial scale, that may be something like uh, changing um, uh, compressors on uh, refriger refrigeration or freezing to, um, equipment. At the commercial scale, that may be uh, you know, uh, uh, changing all of the um, uh, light bulbs in an industrial, in, in a warehouse um, uh, or in a grocery store. Um, and in, for residences, it, it might mean anything from um, changing uh, uh, insulation to uh, uh, installing new appliances, uh, changing light bulbs. There are a vast variety of approaches here and it's important to remember when we're thinking about how to apply these that they have to work together uh, and that some of these will have advantages when, so, when, where others um, uh, struggle. Let me give a really quick uh, example of that. Uh, I've, uh, 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 what you're looking at here is a load curve um, that's showing uh, over the course of the day, the increase in uh, energy usage and, um, or at least uh, the consumption on the California energy grid. Um, and <clears throat> the blue line is the overall electric load. And the orange line is that load um, uh, subtracting out the solar and the wind uh, generation. Um, so what you're actually seeing um, uh, is that in the middle of the day, there's a lot of 
solar and wind generation. And as the day winds down, and um, as uh, people and businesses um, kind of switch from the end of their workday to the start of their evenings, that there's this ramp when the sun is going down and the usage is going and the demand is going up. And you get a really steep um, uptick in the amount of energy that's required and uh, really critical to consider because um, the addition of solar and wind resources actually makes it makes creates a moment for the grid which is more intense than any other moment which is that slope there that high rising slope um, which is <clears throat> um, uh, which is costly for grid operators um, and very carbon intensive because it requires um, the types the types of generation that can handle a fast increase like that are are generally speaking more carbon intensive. Um, so as we consider the types of things that need to happen to the grid, um, we have to consider their impacts not only on the overall load, but also the times of day of that load, the location of that load, and the whole grid context. So um, back to, uh, I think, something that's become a, a, a mantra. Um, and uh, there's definitely some truth to this. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Um, why is this relevant? Um, we need to understand if we make an attempt to change the way that energy is consumed on the grid, that um, it's important to understand that effect, the impact of that effect, in particular, what sorts of companies and, and um, technologies or programs are most effective at accomplishing their goals, what works well, what, help, what helps the grid and what doesn't help the grid, um, and how will that change as the grid changes? Um, where, what are the marginal impacts? Um, where are, where uh, are the, are, are programs designed to, um, to impact uh, demand on the grid um, uh, effective where we hope that they will be? Uh, and during the times of, of day that we hope that there will be. Um, to the extent that capital is available for investment, um, either from the public or private sector, uh, where should that capital be invested? And how can it be known that that is a wise investment? How do we promote innovation in the space? All of these things require measuring impacts. And that is where the open e meter comes in. Um, the timing is right here. Um, uh, in, in the US, we're seeing greater than 60%, uh, last I heard, <laughs> I'm sure it's higher than that now, greater than 60% coverage of smart meters, um, where previously we do not have hourly data. Now we have lots of data, more than, more than many um, uh, entities can handle. Um, and that data tells in great detail um, uh, patterns of usage, even at, down to the site level. Uh, and that, that data is very valuable for understanding the impacts of, of um, programs or technologies or solutions uh, deployed um, to fix uh, demand or supply problems on the grid. So what's hard about measuring things? Um, Spoiler alert, this is where the open e meter will come in. Um, but uh, some of the things that I've run across personally, um, a lot of data is incomplete. It's missing big sections because of power outages or, um, uh, or it's uh, mishandled um, during data transfers or, or um, um, one, one issue is that there are lots of different ways of compute, of, of measuring impact. How do you measure it? Um, what, is the, what are the methods you use and what do those optimize for? What, 
What variables are you taking into account? Um, who can go in and check that that is that the methods that you use to to compute the impact of an event um, uh, or a program are what you say they are. Um, so having the ability to reproduce results is extremely important, as is the ability to do that at scale, to take um, an analysis and repeat it for thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of, of meters. Um, across uh, a nation or a state or, or a jurisdiction. Um, how do you do that while respecting the privacy of the individuals um, uh, whose, whose data or whose company's data uh, is required for that analysis? Um, and, um, and how do you take account of all of the multiple things that are, that are being done as interventions on the grid, including behavioral uh, programs, as well as solar installations, energy efficiency, demand response, and all of that while taking account of the changes of energy usage that have occurred during the course of this global pandemic. Um, these are not easy problems. Um, and, um, uh, and that's where it is helpful to have software that um, helps make some of these easier. So a quick side note, the open EE meter. Um, EE stands for energy efficiency. Oops. Um, as, as time has grown, it's, it's been clear that the open EE meter is useful for much more than just energy efficiency. And I wanna give you a little example of that, which is just a taste of where we can go in the future, and, and um, there will be some um, some suggestions about where where you might go after this um, near the end of these slides. Um, so first, let me talk about demand response. Um, it's um, critical to understand the impact of of a demand response event, and what you're looking at here. Um, is uh, a load shape over the course of a day. Um, <clears throat> and on the very bottom, what you're seeing is, is the impact to usage in terms of percentages. Um, and um, the analysis that needs to go into that, you'll see that there are uh, kind of uh, four different uh, event time series that, that go into this. And, and each of these is, is made possible by um, uh, by the open EE meter, which takes into account um, the time, the, the usage during the time of day as, uh, as it might have occurred without an event, um, as compared to what actually happened during that event. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, additionally subtracts out um, a, a set of comparisons in order to uh, balance out the effect of, of any bias in a mod in, in the modeling. Um, uh, uh, this is one example of kind of, of one way in which the open e meter is being used for something which is not just energy efficiency, but which is isolating the the effect of, of a particular demand response event, uh, even on top of um, energy efficiency. And I'd love to, to talk more about this. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, the open EE meter is built on, um, is, is really a foundation for doing the sort of analysis um, which I was hinting at. Um, and the keys to this software package are that the methods within are re replicable, it's written in code, um, it's open source, um, it's uh, part of the Linux Foundation um, because uh, you know, we're committed to that and that community. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's transparent. It's, it's um, uh, of course, uh, each of these things is a, is a sliding scale and, and the open e-meter is always trying to uh, make things as easy as possible for, for users to understand. And part, part of the foundation of the open e-meter is the creation of site level seasonal and time of week and temperature baseline models. 
Now, what that means is um, the open EE meter gives you a model of how a building performs under a particular set of circumstances based on meter data, um, as well as temperature data and time of week. And um, this, is a, this is the core component from which all open EE meter um, analysis is performed, that this model is used to predict um, the usage uh, patterns of a building in circumstances which were not actually, which did not actually occur, and we call that a counterfactual. Um, it's as if we wish we could split the universe at the point of an event and watch what would have happened with that event and what what would have happened and what did happen without that event. Um, but unfortunately, um, we're not able to do that given the constraints of the physical world. And when an event happens, that's all that happens. And 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 the open meter provides a way of estimating what might have happened. Um, in the absence of that event. And that is a, that is a powerful concept which comes together um, in a number of um, uh, different situations um, with combinations of different models to isolate the various effects of energy efficiency, demand response, um, or storage and load shifting programs. And um, all of that is available um, in the open e meter. Uh, let me talk just briefly about the use cases that those enable. Um, so in particular, um, we're starting with pay for performance. So as, um, as uh, companies and, and innovators sign up for the opportunity to, to show that their, their approach to affecting the grid has impact that they're willing to bet their paycheck on that um, having open source and reliable methods becomes all the more important. This becomes important for, um, for the people who are hoping to procure uh, grid impacts of a particular uh, sort and who are hoping to invest in this. Um, and as um, whenever money gets involved, it's important to also have per performance insurance and to understand the impacts of those um, of, of those events. Uh, finally, who, who uses the open e-meter? This is built on standard, um, uh, widely used libraries. Um, it's a Python open e-meter, is a, is a Python library built on top of pandas and stats models, which should be familiar to many of the data scientists in the crowd. Um, it's a, uh, um, it's, it's possible to get started with even just data from a single site. So we try to make it as, as easy as possible to, to get going with the open e meter. You, don't, you need not be a utility to use this. Um, you can be someone like me who gets a utility bill um, and wants to understand uh, how my energy use is, is changing over time. Um, and it's built on top of public weather sources and now um, uh, there's a little hint of, of how you would use it in Python, uh, just a little um, uh, a little code snippet for you. Um, thanks for being here. I would love for you to go and learn a little bit more about the Open E-Meter um, at the Elf Energy site or follow us on GitHub. Um, get involved, come to our meetups. Um, uh, join our mailing lists. Um, I'm the author of the Open E-Meter and I work at Recurve, um, uh, which uh, incubated and launched the Open E-Meter and uh, would be happy to um, answer any questions uh, either remotely or um, through the facilitators here. So thank you. We are going from <clears throat> high voltage to behind the meter and, and how you act, how we actually are going to be able to create. Um, I think what a lot of folks talk about is price based grid coordination and open e meter is one of the tools that you need to have in order to be able to value uh, investments in energy efficiency. Um, thank you very much, Phil. Um, I would like to um, bring on the next one. Uh, so uh, 
kind of going in the vein around demand, um, this next presentation um, was, uh, it's going to be Stan Johnson, who actually was the developer and uh, Ralph Bennert, who is uh, the, the executive director of the um, Open ADR Alliance. So Open Leader is um, a full complete version of the Open ADR spec. I'm sure they're gonna tell you about that and, uh, and also tell you uh, what to do with it and uh, how it is that uh, Stan, who works for a, a utility in the Netherlands and uh, is um, enabling um, onboarding of e-mobility. So I hope he goes into all of it. Thank you very much, uh, Theo, it, let it roll. Hello, everybody. This is Rolf Bienert, Technical and Managing Director of the OpenADR Alliance. I'm happy to be here today to give you a brief introduction to the OpenADR standard. After that, Stan will continue to give you more information on Open Leader and how to actually implement uh, the Open Leader uh, uh, open source protocol into a product. So let's hop right in. Basically, OpenADR is a non-proprietary open standard to communicate between demand response service providers and resources uh, downstream. So this is typically done through the sec a secure internet connection, which can already be available at the customer site, or of course, it could be done through a dedicated link like a cellular modem or things like that in rare cases. Typically, however, it uses already existing internet connectivity. The OpenADR signal can also be sent to an aggregation point. This aggregation point can be either a, a aggregator company or it could just be simply a facilitator that receives the signal and spreads it out to other devices. For instance, you can imagine this like a cloud-based thermostat control. That being said, OpenADR has been around for quite a while. In fact, since uh, about 2002, when the concept was conceived in California after the energy crisis of 2001. So it's been around a while, but we have improved it over the years. And since 2013 now, we have the final specifications. We are, however, always looking at improvements and making sure that things are going the way they should. OpenADR by now is also an IEC standard uh, listed there, and you can purchase it uh, at the IEC as well. So let's look a little more at the concepts behind OpenADR. We are having, we are seeing, I should say, two different players here. The virtual top node, the VTN, and I believe Stan will also mention these names, so it would be good to, uh, to, to uh, take a good look here and the virtual end node. The virtual top node is a server that manages all the resources. It will create and transmit event messages using OpenADR to the resources out in the field. It can also request reports back with feedback from these resources. The clients, the VENs, uh, consequently are part of the resources out in the field and they can receive these events and will respond to them. All messages are peer to peer. There is no networking involved at this point. The services of OpenADR primarily include the event service, which is very similar to a calendar notice. So you have a start time and an end time and you can send a number of different information elements in there from price information all the way to specific energy requests. Everything can be embedded in these event messages. There are a few other services here, but most important aside from the event service is the report service, which provides feedback from the, from the resources upwards. Everything is XML payloads and we secure the links with a TLS 1.2. Typically, uh, we have seen in the past uh, efforts to flatten the peaks in a, a grid connect system, really only to manage 
the uh, times where there is too much load on the network. That was the initial idea behind OpenADR starting in 2001 and 2002. However, by now we are seeing much more out in the field and OpenADR is being used to send all kinds of control commands to uh, control systems that in turn can then manage other uh, systems like storage, like EV chargers, microgrids and so on and so forth. So all of this is being discussed these days and a lot of it is already implemented. One example here, for instance, is electric vehicle charging systems using OpenADR to send prices or specific energy requests. And then OCPP from the charge station management system to the chargers. Thank you very much. And I'll turn it over now to Stan for his in-depth presentation of Open Leader and how to implement OpenADR. Welcome. Thank you, Rolf, for that introduction to OpenADR. My name is Stan Janssen, and I will show you all about OpenLeader. OpenLeader is a Python package that allows you to quickly integrate OpenADR communication into your existing or new projects. It supports both clients and servers, so you can create both ends of the communication, either for testing or pilots, or whatever suits your application at the moment. It's great for prototyping, fast iteration, pilot projects and exploration, but it's licensed under the Apache 2.0 license, which means it is also applicable for commercial use. Let's dive right in. How can you create an OpenADR VEN or client uh, using OpenLeader? Well, you need to take these four steps. You create an OpenADR client with some basic information about your VEN and the VTN that you want to connect to, like your VEN name and the VTN URL. Then you add, you tell the OpenADR clients which reports you can provide, and you provide a callback function that can generate the values. You give it a handler that needs to be called whenever an event comes in. And that's it. That's all you need to do. Registration, message encrypting and authentication, polling for updates, delivering reports, all of that is taken care of by OpenLeader. Now, what does it look like? This is how you can get started. You import the OpenADR client from OpenLeader. You create a client with a VEN name and a VTN URL, and you run it on the Python async.io event loop. That's it. Now, after you run this client, here's what happens. The VEN will first do a OADR query registration, which asks the VTN which protocols it supports and some other meta information. And the VTN will reply with a uh, OADR created party registration message that tells you all about the VTN. Uh, then it decides to register to this VTN with the VEN name. The VTN will check it and will do some validation and authentication and it will give you a unique VEN ID and a registration ID. Now, you don't need to remember those IDs. Those are remembered by OpenLeader and they are incorporated into all of the messages that you send out. And then the VEN will automatically start polling for new messages. So every, for instance, 10 seconds, it will ask the VTN, do you have anything new for me? And it can either say no and you get an empty response or it can say yes i have an event for you and then you can get to work uh, dealing with that event now for security you would not um, just use plain http without any form of authentication so you use https and you use client-side certificates and by simply adding these three lines you uh, automatically add TLS encryption over the connection and you automatically sign your XML messages so the VTN can be sure that they weren't tampered with in transit. And if you also want to check that the messages from the VTN are actually from the VTN you think it is, uh, you add their fingerprint and it will automatically validate that. So this, is, this takes care of all of the security 
of your communications in a very elegant way. Now, the, the client is now connected and securely connected, but it's not doing anything useful yet. So let's add some reporting. The only thing we need to do is add a report. So client.addReport. We give it a function, a callback function, that can generate the values. In this case, it reads an electricity meter. Um, we tell it what resource it applies to and what, what the measurement is. In this case, it's voltage and at what sampling rate we can supply these uh, measurements. And that's it. What happens now after registration is it sends a create report to the VTN that contains your newly created report. Uh, the VTN decides if it wants the report or not and it lets you know and if they want it the open leader then will automatically set up the scheduler that will call your function to retrieve the values and um, send off the reports to the VTN and then the VTN just receives the values which is pretty straightforward and uh, pretty simple and it only took a few lines of code and this part in blue of course happens over and over at the requested report interval now we're sending out reports but now we also want to handle events that come in so we add a handler for the on event event um, in this case uh, your handler will simply receive a dictionary that contains all of the information on the event and you can unpack it you can look at the signals in the event you can look at the individual intervals in the event and the values that it sets and in this case we uh, um, tell a hypothetical control device to execute this schedule in the future and we, we only need to return opt-in or opt-out. So if you are taking part in this event, you return opt-in and otherwise re you return opt-out. And Open Leader will send the correct response to the VTN. And that's it. Now you've integrated uh, registration, reporting and event handling into your VEN in just a few minutes and just a few lines of code. And all you need to do is focus on your own uh, device control model which is pretty great. Now let's take a look at the other side. Let's take a look at the server, the virtual top node. It's pretty similar. You create a open ADR server with a VTN ID. This is how you identify yourself to the events that connect to you. And you run it. Um, and now clients can connect, but there's nothing much interesting happening. So we need to implement three things, which is the registrations, the reporting, and the events. So we add a handler for the party registrations. This will be called whenever a party sends a yes, I want to register, and this is my VEN name. Uh, it calls your callback function with the registration info. You look it up in your database. I implemented a very uh, dummy implementation here that simply checks for one VEN name, but you would go out and uh, look up in your database or something. And if you, uh, if you agree to this, then you return a VEN ID and a registration ID to the VEN. That's all you need to do. The OpenADR message will be packed up automatically. Or if it's not allowed, you simply return false and it will reject the client. Now, then the client is probably going to offer you some reports. So you add a handler on register report. And if you make this handler have the signature of resource ID, measurement, unit, scale, minimum and maximum, sampling intervals, uh, then, you all, then you get each measurement as a separate call to that function and for each of those measurements you can decide do I want this or do I not want this and at what interval do I want to receive these reports. And you again you return a handler that will be called whenever one of those reports comes in and you return a uh, sampling interval. And that's it. Now, one, once the VEN starts sending you these update report messages, your store voltage handler in this case will get called with the data. It receives a list of time value pairs and you can put them in a database or you can analyze them or you can do whatever you want with them. Again, in just a few lines of code. Now that we received the reports, 
you probably want to send out some events and that couldn't be easier as well. The only thing you need to do is call server.addEvent, add your event details in there, so for which van is this event meant and what type and name of the signal and what are the intervals that you're going to give it and what, what is the target of your event and you also give it a callback so that once the opt-in or opt-out response comes in, you'll be notified if the event actually took part in it or not. Again, it's very simple. And this event will be put onto a queue. And whenever the VEN does the poll, um, the automatic queuing mechanism will supply this message to the VEN and everything else happens automatically. Let me give you a short demonstration of OpenLeader in action with an actual VTN server and a VEN that controls a controllable device. All right, so here I've prepared a demonstration setup containing an OpenADR VEN right here. This is a Raspberry Pi that is running the OpenLeader software, which is connected to this energy meter and it's connected to this switch, which controls this flexible device. We also have a non-flexible device, which is controlled by a manual switch, and everything is powered by the electricity grid. Now, I've designed it in such a way that turning on these devices will lower the voltage on, the, on this part of the grid, and that's something that we report to the VTN. And the VTN is set up to receive these reports. It looks at the voltage that is being reported. And whenever it exceeds 230 volts, the flexible device can turn on. And whenever it dips below 215 volts, the flexible device has to turn off. All right, let's see it in action. Let's turn on the non-flexible device. And let's start up the VEN. Now, in the charts on the left, you can see the metering data that is coming in. And this is what the VEN is reporting to the VTN. As we can see, we're now using about 4 watts. And the voltage is, a, is just below 230. So this is all good but it's too low for the flexible device to be turned on. All of this reporting is fully automatic. The only thing we needed to do was register our reports, set up a handler that reads the energy meter, and everything else happens automatically. Now, watch what happens if we turn off the non-flexible device. the voltage goes up to above 230, which triggers an event, and that event says you can turn on your flexible device, which just happened. And although that caused the voltage to drop below 230, that's no, that's no problem because that's a safe area for the voltage to be. If we now turn on the non-flexible device, you'll notice that the voltage dips below 215, which triggers another event that says you have to turn off your flexible device, and the flexible device turns off. You can also see the status, which is nicely reported in the bottom chart, the yellow one. And this is how easy it is. So we've got all the facets of OpenADR up and running here. We have reporting, we have events, we've had the whole registration part which we didn't even see because it happened automatically and it's very easy to just link this up to your existing infrastructure whether it be physical devices like this energy meter or this switch or whether it be your existing infrastructure like this um, time series database that I'm connecting to on the VTN side. One more time, if we turn off the non-flexible device, the voltage will again rise, which will trigger an event, and that event will say you can turn on your flexible device now, and that's what happens. 
So fully automatic, um, completely compliant to OpenADR, and super simple to set up. I hope this gives you a taste of what you can do with OpenADR and with OpenLeader. Now that you've seen what OpenLeader can do and how easy it is to get started, please help us make it even better. You can find us at openleader.org and you can find us on GitHub at github.com slash openleader. I also would like to thank all of the other open source developers that helped make this what it is, particularly the developers of LXML, AIO HTTP and Jinja2. Those are at the heart of the OpenLeader package. And of course, this entire video presentation was also made using open source software. So thank you for that. In closing, I'd like to thank the Linux Foundation Energy for their support and their outreach. And I would like to thank ELATNL and the OpenADR Alliance for their technical support as well. Thank you very much for watching this presentation and we hope to hear from you soon. That's great. Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> Rolf has been uh, working with OpenADR for such a long, uh, you know, he, he, he's, he has really held um, that organization together and brought it out into the world. And um, this partnership with ALAD and with Stan is great um, because there is now a, a fully compliant OpenADR uh, uh, client and server. And um, just to give you a sense, so that's how uh, electric um, charging is being managed by the distribution utilities in uh, the Netherlands. Um, OpenADR is the protocol that Japan is using uh, to onboard distributed energy resources. Um, OpenADR is how um, much of the United States manages um, demand response. So there you have it. Um, we, we now have a global um, industrial strength uh, open ADR, open leader. That was great. So the last video we have is, um, is uh, Operator Fabric. And uh, the story that I can tell about Operator Fabric was the first time that I came to Paris to meet um, the uh, RTE and, and the folks from uh, who, who were building uh, the software within and they were like going, you know, we, we want to move to open source and RT really was the founding uh, utility. And um, Boris and uh, Guillaume and, uh, and Benoit all came together and kind of did these demonstrations of operator fabric. And I went, wow, this is really amazing. These guys have a vision of the future and of the future of the control room. And uh, so uh, please, uh, this last demonstration is uh, Boris Dali and Hena Safi, and they're going to take you through operator fabric. Hello, my name is Boris. I work in the French TSO transmission system operator, which is RTE, as a project manager. Today, I'm going to show you what is Operator Fabric, the smart assistant for utility system operators. First, I'll try from a theoretical point of view to answer those questions. What is Operator Fabric about? What does it look like? How does it work from a software architecture point of view? And what is the technology stack? Why should you use it and join the open source community? And then Anna will show you a real use cases demonstration. What is Upfab about? You can read Upfab and, and hear Upfab because we use the short name of Operator Fabric. And if you use it a lot, you can call it OF. The purpose of Upfab is to provide the right information to the right person at the right time. As I told you, it's very theoretical, but you see it make a lot of sense. Uh, by the way, we reduce the number of operator screen. Uh, 
as you can see on this picture you have uh, the control room with a lot of screens facing uh, the operator and then we have less screen and a key screen is uh, the operator fabric screen the goals for a utility system whatever is the business either water gas or electricity is to improve the coordination between actors of different trades in a company inside a same trade it's easy to uh, coordinate operators but among different trades it's a real challenge and operator fabric is a great tool for that it offers the centralization of all the information for a business process and thanks to that you can capitalize on decision you can analyze what happened when why if you try to do it with a classical control room with phone calls it's hard to capitalize on decisions it's a cyber secured tool because it assets uh, each year the code and the architecture and it offers of course transparency interoperability etc etc what does it look like on the left this is the main uh, feature the card feed you have notification in operator fabric represented by cards one card is one notification for an operator and one card represents a state of a process at the time you are watching it so we have four colors first red then orange blue and green it's a severity level red level means you as an operator we need you to uh, take decision or make an action orange you have to know what happened on this process blue it's an information about the process and green it's an information that you are waiting for on a process it's okay but you need to know that this is okay on the right side of the screen in this pane you see when you click on a card the detail of a card you can of course just read the message or interact with this message and then the last part is the timeline here is the real-time view RT as you can see here and you have uh, bubbles which are the time viewing of the card notification you can click on that and go to the cards of course and you have a, a day view seven day view uh, which is the business week and you have the week the month and year if you want from a software uh, architecture perspective operator fabric is very simple why because operator fabric is able to send a card by itself we call it free messages but the goal of operator fabric is to receive notification through rest apis so it's very low cost to bring operator fabric in your it system because your application are maybe already ready to send uh, notification through rest apis so you can bring into your control room really easily and that's what we did the technology stack is at this state of art it's a web application so it's a java and spring development and there is a full ci cd solution so you can find everything on the code on our github and on the website the git pages site you can find everything about the community this community is very dynamic and very professional the license of the software is mozilla public license version 2 and we really would like you to jump in so take it with you and go back to us and i your turn you can go live for the demo So thanks, Boris, for this great, interesting introduction of the main concepts of Operator Fabric. I'm uh, Anna Safi, the current product owner of Operator Fabric, and I'm really thrilled today to make this demo. So first, before starting, I just would like to make a short disclaimer. So the two use cases that I'm about to show you today are highly inspired from real ones 
but we've made some uh, modification to make it simple for those who are novice in the energy field and also for confidentiality matters. So the first example that I want to show you today is about IGCC, which stands for International Grid Control Corporation. I will start first by giving some background information about the IGCC. So each transmission system operator like RTE has the responsibility to keep the voltage and frequency at a certain level and ensure that the equilibrium between the consumption and the production is met. So when there is an imbalance between production and consumption, frequency and voltage change in the grid. And if nothing is done, it can lead at some point to a blackout. So to avoid these kind of situations, TSO have established several mechanisms. And among them, there is what we call the automatic frequency restoration process, which aim is to restore the frequency to 50 Hertz. So long story short, this mechanism consists in injecting or withdrawing electric coal power in the grid to restore the frequency level. This mechanism has been streamlined to be performed at the European grid level to ensure more cooperation between TSOs and is now known under the name of IGCC. So every country compute the power they can provide to the grid if there is a need to, re to restore the frequency. The IGCC energy quantity is computed several times a day and takes into account the events that occur in the grid system. So in my example, I will show you a screen of an operator uh, who will receive information about the IGCC level throughout the day. So now I'm uh, I'm logging in the first uh, in the main page of Retro Fabric, and I will simulate an API call from a third app informing about the IGCC level. So as you have seen, uh, my my user have just received a new card about the IGCC saying there is uh, we have to lower. Uh, the, the, the level we can't uh, provide more 300 megawatts. And let's say that during the day there is a contingency or a critical situation and we can lo no longer participate to this uh, mechanism. So this card will be updated and as you have seen, the card moved from orange to red to warn the operator that there is an issue and the quantity now is equal to zero. So let's say at the final step that we've made some, that the situation has changed and is now back to normal. So the IGCC level is recomputed again to take uh, into account the new situation and card will now be updated and it will turn to green to say that well everything is good we can participate can go back to the normal level and we can participate to restore the frequency level if needed so as you can see uh, a card can be updated to to inform about uh, new situations and uh, what i want you also to notice is that in the same screen and that is really the power of operator fabric is that we can receive data and updates from several apps uh, such as in this example um, i'm receiving about, uh, information about igcc but at the same time i can receive information about uh, network contingencies planned outages uh, the electricity forecast conception and uh, now i suggest to move to the second one throughout this example what i want to show you uh, is how we can use operator fabric facilitate and to make easy the coordination between different entities it's a pretty basic uh, example it's not linked 100 percent to the electrical field it's made on purpose to show you that we can use operator fabric in different contexts so let's move to operator fabric now i will uh, log in with 
another user uh, who is from an IT supervision center. Let's say he has noticed an issue in the network and he wants uh, to uh, notify different control rooms about uh, this issue. This time I won't make uh, I won't simulate um, uh, a third app, but I will do it uh, by manually by creating a card directly from Operator Fabric. So in case, for instance, of emergency of our typical situation, we can use the card creation feature. So let's say this is a critical issue, so it will be an alarm and say it's a network slowdown uh, investigation let's say that uh, it has an impact or on app a app b or service a service b whatever and uh, i will send this card to the control room one and control room two because i think that uh, they are they are the ones who are uh, involved and impacted by uh this uh, issue so i would send the card see that the card has been created and now i will log out and log in as operator one who belongs to the control control room one and i will take i will see uh, the card coming Yes, I can respond to this card uh, to give maybe further um, uh, information and uh, to respond, to answer the IT supervisor that I have noticed also uh, issues on service C, for instance. I will validate the answer. As you can see, we can, uh, the, the, the answer is, my answer is displayed and the name of my control room turns to green to say that I have answered to this card. So what I uh, suggest is to log out and connect as operator 2 who belongs to the control room 2. You see he has also received this card and he can see that the control room uh, one has already responded to this card. He can give uh, his own point of view of the impact that he has noticed. Let's say he's sharing the same point of view with the control room one. So I will tick these three boxes and validate my answer. So as you might see, control room two has turned uh, to green uh, as well as long as the operator has responded to the card so and let's say this card will be updated when the issue will be resolved and it will turn to green uh, to say okay everything is back um, to uh, normal so i hope that through this second example you have seen how we can use operator fabric as a coordination tools so that brings us to the end of this demo and the end of this presentation i hope that it has been very informative on behalf of operator fabric team rte and lf energy i would like to thank you for your attention um, we remain at your disposal if you have any question or any suggestion will be more than happy to discuss it uh, with you. Thank you very much. You know, it makes me so happy to see all that. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, um, these guys have come a really long way. Uh, open source and utilities have, um, it's a pretty new innovation. Uh, you have an industry globally uh, in which for the most part have been dominated by uh, a, a few vendors and in which regulators have 
in many ways, uh, taken away the capacity of utilities to be able to actually lead and um, do their work at the speed of technology. So uh, these guys are breaking down walls and you can hear the joy and excitement and enthusiasm what they're doing. So I, I really want to invite you all uh, to uh, take a look. So I'm gonna close with just a couple of, um, um, just a couple of things before I leave, before we all leave, okay. And, you know, again, if you want to leave a question, please do. So um, I want to let you know about how to do code contributions. Um, LF Energy is growing, as you saw with the, you know, pretty um, large functional architecture. Um, we're talking about a microservices environment uh, that, you know, I, I can kind of imagine what will be different about LF Energy and the other projects at the Linux Foundation is we probably will have hundreds of projects. We have two projects that are starting up right now um, that are actually based on code from other foundations. And so we're learning how to do that. We're learning how to compose the future. There's a new project that's coming in that's a multi-protocol gateway that's based on Fledge, which is an LF Edge. And we have another project that's a digital bill of material, which is around supply chain security um, that's coming out of the DBOM uh, consortium. So there are basically two ways that projects come into the foundation. One is through special interest groups or working groups, and the other one is through you know project proposal that comes directly in. Um, so you can go to the wiki, um, and it's wiki.lfenergy.org, and you will see um, that there's a project proposal process. Um, please take a look at it, and um, we're really interested in any software uh, contributions. Um, so um, please take a look if that's of interest to you. And let's see. Um, join our community. So if you go to lfenergy.org slash join, uh, uh, I'm sorry, lfenergy.org slash community, um, you will see that we've really done our best to get organized, um, set up your community and communication channels, learn about the frameworks, join a special interest group, start a working, um, start working on a project. Um, you can see that uh, links to the wiki, to the mailing list, and to Slack. Um, you know, we're at the very beginning. The next 10 years are are gonna be the most important 10 years in humanity in many ways. And um, so, you know, communicating uh, with you all and sharing this, it, you know, it, it is a thrill of a lifetime for me. And I know for all of the developers and power system engineers um, that you saw tonight. Um, so go jump in, get involved. Um, we're just beginning. It's a little bit like a frontier town sometimes, um, but, you know, we're getting it. Um, you know, like in any of the other foundations, uh, you know, the idea is 80% open source, 20% competing on products and services. Um, and, you know, this leverage development model is really alive and well in LF Energy. And that is where the cooperation and the collaboration is getting built. Um, and that is what an open source open, open source software ecosystem looks like. I'm getting tired. Um, so uh, I, but I'm really excited by this. So, and I think that you all know what the benefits of the Linux Foundation are. Um, so I'm gonna keep moving. Um, what I do wanna share with you is kind of our membership and participation levels. Um, really, we have uh, two tiers. We have a strategic membership tier and we have a general membership tier. Um, all of this is on our website. It's all posted. You can find it all. Um, please come and join us. Absolutely, any project is open. Uh, you don't have to be a member to join, just like all the other projects at the Linux Foundation. But part of what's really important and special about what's happening here in LF Energy is that we really are creating um, a community that is going to transform the power systems on the planet and are going to enable in that way automobile companies to transform because if the grids aren't ready for the automobiles 
then how are you gonna charge the automobiles? So we're kind of in this together. And, you know, I would also say that with regards to cloud and to, you know, infrastructure and large computing systems, we have to figure out how to create, you know, carbon neutral carbon negative computing infrastructure. And where I think, you know, some, by some estimates, five to 8% of uh, the planet's energy is going to computing or is going to be going to computing. And yes, we are probably going to double the amount of energy that we're going to consume in the next 30 years. So in order to be able to do that, we have to get really good at onboarding renewable energy and being able to orchestrate devices and that energy. So come and join our community. It's the best place to learn how to do it and to be part of it. Um, we are going to change the world. And um, thank you very much for your time. This is my contact information. Um, I am always reachable. Uh, that's our website, uh, how to join our mailing list, our wiki. I think many of you also know Mike Dolan. You can also reach out to him. Uh, thank you very much to Theo and um, to all the folks that helped make this who just has been amazing. Um, our colleagues from Sony, um, you know, having you on board, uh, you are helping us shift uh, our center of gravity um, from Europe to North America to Asia and Australia. And, um, you know, we, this is a global event that we are decarbonizing our economies together. And this is ground zero. So thank you very much. Um, I'm always open for questions. Feel free to reach out to me, uh, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn. And thank you very much. I hope you have a good rest of your day and a good summit. Stay healthy, have a happy new year. And 2021 is gonna be a much better year, I'm pretty sure. Thank you.